We are joined again by the wonderful Mr. Serverless, uh, Jeff Holland. And uh, fun fact about Jeff, he was once on the Ellen Show. <laughs> <laughs> that, that needs repeating. <laughs> um, and we're also joined by the incredible, I am so, so excited to welcome Marie Hoger. Uh, she is a software engineer on Azure Functions. So again, if you enjoy using Azure Functions, these are two of the people that you should absolutely thank um, and of course give them a warm round of applause they're going to be talking about best practices in azure functions and i cannot wait for this session to begin so over to both of you uh, Thanks, thank you yeah thank you so much simona uh, marie i'm thrilled to be on this with you i don't if folks don't know we do a monthly team webcast we just did one like <laughs> a week ago Marie showed up and legit just stole the show. <laughs> like stole the show. I just checked Too last nice. night, Marie, <laughs> at like the YouTube call, and and someone just like yesterday commented, they're like, "That was so much fun following along on this demo." <laughs> so uh, when I found out, I got the That's chance awesome. to be on this with you. Yeah, uh, folks, yeah. You need to check that out. Thanks. Yeah, uh, I I don't have any live coding today. I'm just kind of showing. <laughs> yeah, but but I am gonna call you out a little bit more. So I hope oh, folks okay. can look forward to that. <laughs> that is fair. Uh, and and this is a good session around best practices, especially because. I have the habit as a PM that I will go in front of a conference or a virtual event and I'll say like, do serverless for everything. Not very good at programming, but I, I'm very passionate about functions. REA on the dev side has to deal with all of the ramifications <laughs> of that, actually customers doing things correctly and opening support tickets. Uh, so Maria, this is our chance to set the record straight and let people know <laughs> this is the best way to do stuff. Uh, so anything top of mind, I guess, as, as yeah, we start off for the next session. Definitely. So I think uh, kind of like the structure we were thinking about doing is like going over um, like kind of three main categories of, of things that you should keep in mind for best practices. Uh, the first one is like during development, and then the next is deployment and scale. And then the last one is troubleshooting. Um, and so we're going to try to kind of like hit a lot of topics, um, but hopefully like the, the goal of the session is to to give you something to like keep in mind as you're developing at each point. Um, yeah, so I think um, first topic development. Um, the, the first thing I think that uh, Jeff also is definitely pushing for is like, first of all, start with local development um, for sure. And um, let's see, I can, Jeff, I can actually just show something right now. Yeah, um, that's awesome. Okay, cool, cool. Yeah, so so starting with local development, and then um, if y'all don't already use the VS Code extension, it's amazing. Um, so highly recommend. Do, do, do. Yeah, that, um, is, that is that is like best practice one. I'm even looking at some of your notes. It's like do <laughs> local development, like the portal. It's okay if you want to kick the tires a little bit when you're trying things out. But as soon as you're done, just looking around, like if you're at this point in our virtual conference, you've shown a level of interest, you should really take some time to set up that local dev experience. It's going to help you out in the long run for sure. Yeah, totally agreed. All right. Um, so here is also, if you haven't seen it, here's kind of what the um, the functions uh, VS Code extension looks like. You can initialize a project. Uh, you can add a new function, and it has all of our great templates here. Um, so, like, whenever I start developing a function, this is always where I come to first. Um, the other kind of like best practice slash also tip um, that was kind of inspired by conversations with other folks in the serverless community um, is the fact that you can use multiple output bindings and input bindings. Um, so the, the quick example that I have here today um, is going to be using an HTTP trigger with HTTP response, a blob output, and a queue output. Um, and, and so kind of the cool pattern that you can do here is we have an HTTP response where like user uploads some content, we store it in a blob, and then we also pass like a queue message that says, hey, this is the reference to the blob that I want to process and do some like, you know, kind of cool operations on. Um, so this is also really great for if your transformation process takes a long time. Um, that's kind of like one of the tips too of best practice. You want to keep your function executions uh, kind of shorter and more bite-sized. Um, and so, so here's kind of a way to show doing that. Um, if we transition over here, now we have a different function that is taking in the queue with this blob input, blob output. 
Um, and so basically it is taking in the queue message, it retrieves um, from the queue message, it retrieves the name of that blob and then like inputs it into your function. Um, and then you can put it in a processed queue or processed like container. Um, this is great. This is a good tip. And I, I'm going to throw a question at here, Marie. I'm, yeah. Something I hear a few times around bindings. Uh, is there a recommended, like, sh when should I be using bindings and when maybe, like in in these examples where you're sending uh, maybe you're using output bindings, how should I think about when bindings is the right thing and maybe when I should be using the SDK or does it matter either way? Yeah, yeah, great question. Um, so the input and output binding, um, like right now for JavaScript is kind of like a simple um, like read or write operation. Um, and so there are sometimes cases where you need to do something more complicated. So an example is like with the Cosmos DB binding, um, sure read and write is great, but maybe I need to do like a delete or something, right? And so um, in those cases, um, for the input and output bindings, we would actually probably say like, go ahead and use those SDKs um, instead of relying on the input output bindings. Um, triggers are kind of a different story where triggers will always uh, kind of be, be the path forward. Like you don't want to have a timer triggered function that like <laughs> queries for new queue messages or something like that. So like do not use the SDK for sure. Um, but but I think that's a really good call out too. Of I think some people will try to be like, okay, like I'm trying to do all of this crazy complicated stuff with just like the bindings. But but again, if it's like beyond a read and write, um, at that point, just like like you know the the path forward is the SDK itself. That's great. And and we're, while we're looking at this app view before we start to move to some of the things like scale or troubleshooting. Uh, th th there's a lot of thoughts around this app concept. It is unique to Azure Functions in the serverless world that we give you this function app. So anything that folks should think about with that concept about how they should treat or think about what this app means and how it means for how I'm developing however many functions I might stick in my app. Yeah, I, I'm really glad you mentioned that because I think um, we were talking about kind of like best practices and um, one of the ways to frame thinking about those best practices is to understand what a function app is. Um, and so in this project, um, I actually have a third function um, that is both of these functions, um, they have different triggers, but they're using the same core logic. Um, and that's coming from over here. And they're also sharing the same node modules. Um, and so thinking about it that way, like for, for starters, you can do this pattern, right, of like having two different uh, triggers on the same kind of core logic. Um, and then the other part of that is um, whenever an instance is deployed, we're going to dynamically scale those instances. But you should remember that like, it's not like each individual function with each individual like trigger scaling independently, they're all going to scale together. Um, and so, so one thing that comes up with that is like how many functions should your function app have? Um, and so it, of course we can't give you like a hard number of like no more than 10 or something because it totally depends on what your functions do um, and how executing in the same environment might interact with each other. Um, the other thing that kind of like, again, thinking about this app model is one instance when it's up, it's going to be handling a lot of different function executions, maybe just for the same function. Uh, but one pattern that we see um, is if you don't use connection pooling or say like you instantiate a new connection client per execution. Um, I think when you just look at it in terms of like the here's my index.ts or JS um, and here's my function JSON, it can be super easy to think like, oh yeah, like the whole environment just goes away after that execution. Um, but, but remember that those things persist, uh, but you cannot guarantee their persistence if you try to like save state or something like that. Yeah, that's great. I, I like it's easy to think about when you're writing these things that a single execution just kind of appears and then disappears independently on its own. But it's helpful that's not actually happening, and that you know you have an app that gets uh, initialized and it will actually hang around and process maybe multiple requests at the same time, and so be a little bit more efficient in in how you're creating clients or reusing clients. I think that's a great call out. Yeah. Uh, okay. Okay, so we got about seven minutes. Uh, I know you. There's a bit here about like once this app is running, and yep. you go ahead and publish the thing. Uh, yep. Like now it is running. Now we are doing the scale thing, <laughs> and there's you know different hosting options we have. There's different ways it scales. Best practices top of mind here, Marie. 
Yeah, definitely. Um, so let's see, I'll skip a ahead real quick. But one thing to note is like that consumption based scaling, where we consume or, you know, create or shut down instances based off of the incoming requests. Um, and of course, that comes with it cold start. Um, so kind of like the three main points I wanted to hit is um, knowing your load, knowing your latency requirements and knowing your platform needs. Um, so those are kind of like really generic uh, things to think about. So so breaking that down a little bit, um, load is is thinking about is your workload unpredictable and spiky or is it more consistent and constant? Um, because sometimes that we've actually seen, um, if you have a pre-provisioned environment, which you can also do with Azure Functions, um, then then you actually like end up saving on some money <laughs> uh, if you you know if you have like a constant stream of queue messages to process or something like that. Um, if your workload is more unpredictable and spiky, that's where like that consumption dynamic elastic scale that's where it really shines. Um, so thinking about what's what your um, load is going to look like is super important. Um, and then here's kind of like. Yeah, these are like the, the plans whenever you choose to deploy um, that will support that elastic scaling. Um, yeah, absolutely. And I, I think the way I think about this often too is start with consumption. Like don't, don't like it's totally. going to work for a bunch of people. But is if you find out there's something there, like Maria called out a bunch of good stuff, like, hey, cold start, or do I actually care about cost for, for reserve stuff? And then you can start to peel back and say, like, okay, well, maybe I want the premium tier, or maybe it goes all the way to like, I need this thing to run on premises, so I'm going to choose the Kubernetes flavory thing. Um, but often you can kind of start simple, but know that you have room to grow and you have options where you can make those trade-offs and choices. Yeah, totally. And Jeff, you already kind of hit it. Uh, just to summarize a little bit again, like, like is a latency requirement? Do you have that? Like, is any cold start okay? Um, so you might be looking at um, a, either like a dedicated plan or like the Elastic Premium plan. If you're just like, I can never have cold start um, in in my code. Um, and so then the last one too that Jeff, you also touched on is platform needs. Um, so do you want a managed environment or a high degree of control? Um, and we have a lot of different options kind of on a sliding scale um, to say that like, I want maybe like, you know, VNet integration. So we're looking more at like the premium or dedicated plan, um, or maybe like I have like a really, like I need to use a Docker image um, because I have this like really specific requirement. Okay, so you're probably looking more at like, you know, uh, deploying through through a Docker image, like on a premium plan or something like that. Yeah, that's perfect. Uh, and uh, Marie, we've got we've got about three or four minutes here. I'll, I'll kind of leave it. I know we 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 talked a little bit about CI/CD. We talked a little bit about troubleshooting. Any yep. any topics that you specifically are just like burning that you want to want to run with, and we can go in that direction. Yeah, totally. Uh, so one last super quick tip, and this is a little selfish because it, it helps with our deflection, uh, but troubleshooting. So oh, yeah. <laughs> so uh, where where to like for for one. Um, that you can look at the Azure Functions repo, and uh, we're open source. So this like little table gives you a really nice rundown of um, if you're experiencing issues in different areas, where to file those issues. Um, the thing that I really, really wanted to highlight is uh, in the Azure portal, there's this diagnose and solve pane. Um, and so you can run all of these different kind of uh, dashboards and queries. Um, and like as a little background, like like our team develops all of these queries kind of based off of our own investigations into um, issues. And so like here, I have a bad async pattern. So I'm doing async void, which is gonna cause a lot of scale problems. Um, and so this is like a super, super good tool. Um, and we're always updating this with the latest dashboards um, to, to really help give you kind of like personalized guidance. Uh, so like availability and performance. Um, so please check out the diagnose and solve pane is my Yeah, that, that very much advice. is a, yeah, it's a, it's a almost hidden tab. It's there, at least I don't yeah. think about it a whole lot. But Mario is totally right. It's actually really cool how these things are developed and that as we're getting support tickets and as we're trying to make sure things are working, we're building all these tools to go and analyze your function and to help give us a clue of like, oh, this, they've misconfigured this and, and just keep it for ourselves. We expose the majority of them right here in diagnose and solve. Uh, so you can go through and click through and have it analyze and or look at our telemetry and look at the platform stuff. So absolutely a good to go. If something seems off, 
clicking through and seeing if maybe something we built is doing it. And these are popping up all of the time too. So it's very likely that if you use this thing six months ago, there's probably like three or four new detectors or what we'll them totally. that are floating around there now. So that's, that's a really good pro tip and something that might actually be news to a bunch of people watching. Yeah, love it. Great. Um, okay. So I'm, I'm checking time. Uh, I think <laughs> we are right at the spot. Uh, and so I just want to say, Mario, thank you again. And I'll, I'll just let you know, there is more gushing about this webcast. So I, I, you know, I'm a bit of an egotistical person. Uh, I don't know <laughs> if we're going to let you on the webcast again, <laughs> uh, but you also crushed it here a ton for rocking through a bunch of these best practices, very clearly communicated a lot of good stuff. Uh, so thanks a ton for joining anything else you want to plug or mention before we pass it over to, to Simona to take us to the next session. Uh, I think that's about it. Yeah. Th thanks so much, everyone. Yeah. Thank you all very much. Uh, it's been a blast chatting. Amazing. Oh, my God. I loved it. I I had no idea. One of the screens that I absolutely love is a trouble, a troubleshooting one. I'm so glad that you showed that one, Marie. And I, I know that it's been evolving so fast over the past six uh, months and one year, and it's always a very useful uh, screen to to have a look at um, and I had no idea that it was connected to the Azure Functions GitHub repository so it sounds like the two are connected and we're um, we're getting from those issues uh, we're getting intelligence into our portal that's really really awesome um, and um, a good reminder for everyone else on this uh, stream as well that Azure Functions Runtime um, and many other uh, extensions are open source and you can log uh, issues on GitHub and check out all the code, submit your pull requests. I know, uh, I know that we have quite a number of uh, community contributors to, uh, to some of these extensions and uh, it's so, so great to, to see all this code in GitHub as well. Um, a reminder to everyone here, if you want to um, have a conversation with uh, Jeff and Marie, uh, please check out the, the office hours on Dev2. Leave your insights, your knowledge, your questions there. They're, they're delighted to join you there. Um, also, Jeff, just want to mention, um, we, we invited Marie two months ago to the stream. So um, it happened here first. <laughs> <laughs> you, you, saw the talent. you saw the talent even before blowing away that webcast. Yep. Okay. It's going to get all red here. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we, we, we're probably going to, um, there has to be a Chris and Chris show and the Jeff and Marie show. <laughs> uh, uh, sign me up. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay, let's do it. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Thank you both for sharing all these awesome uh, tips. Uh, I'll see you in a bit waving again. Um, you are all amazing. Um, and warm uh, a round of applause from everyone from the stream for Jeff and Marie. Check out the resources that they have shared um, and make sure to follow some of the best practices that they have followed as well. They have uh, shared as well.